another very dear friend is Beth Carver Weiss, who's curator emerita of the American Wing at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where for 20 years, she oversaw the collections of American silver, jewelry, and other metalwork. Prior to joining the Met staff in 2000, Beth was curator of decorative arts at the Clark Art Institute in Williamstown, Massachusetts. She lectures internationally and is the author of numerous articles and books, including English, Irish, and Scottish silver at the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute and early American silver in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She was one of the six organizing curators for the Met's exhibition, Jewelry, The Body Transformed, as well as a contributor to its catalog. Her special exhibition, Jewelry for America, was on view at the Met from June 2019 to May 2021. Beth holds degrees in art history from Smith College and the Williams College Graduate Program in the History of Art. She's an alumna of the Addingham Summer School and the Royal Collection Studies, but perhaps most importantly, she currently serves as president of the board of the American Friends of Addingham. I'd like to just say she's the Empress of Addingham. She also sits on the advisory board for the Association for the Study of Jewelry and Related Arts. And Beth will be speaking to us on the devotion and affection of a grateful people, American Presentation Silver. Please welcome Beth Carver Reese. Hello, everyone. I'm Beth Carver Reese. Thank you for joining me. I would like to begin my presentation by asking you a question Why is this man smiling? He is smiling because he is Novak Djokovic. And when this photograph was taken on June 13th, he had just won the 2021 French Open, his 19th Grand Slam tennis championship. To mark that achievement, he was presented with what has for centuries been considered the appropriate award on just such occasions, an engraved silver trophy. But what is it about silver that makes it so appropriate as a presentation object. The reasons are both simple and complex. Silver is one of the Earth's most precious elements and one in which craftsmen have worked since antiquity. Intrinsically valuable, it has traditionally been associated with financial security, with elevated social status, and with personal and professional accomplishments, such as winning the French Open. Social status has long been a reason to own silver as indicated by many historical notations. Following a dinner party he hosted in April of 1667, the English diarist Samuel Pepys recorded with pride the gratifying admiration of his guests. And I quote, Lord, to see with what envy they looked upon all my fine plate was pleasant, for I made the best show I could to let them understand me and my condition. The term plate incidentally uh, simply means wrought silver, not uh, what we would call silver plate. For Pepys, who was then a rising civil servant, an impressive display of plate confirmed his social and professional status, as well as his sophisticated taste. Some 20 years later across the Atlantic, the English-born Virginia planter William Fitzhugh furnished his 13-room home with over 120 silver objects that he had ordered from London and much of it engraved with his family's armorials. In 1688, placing an order with his London agent, Fitzhugh expressed both contemporary and traditional values when he wrote, quote, I esteem it as well politic as reputable to furnish myself with a handsome cupboard of plate, which gives myself the present use and credit, is a sure friend at a dead lift without much loss, or is a certain portion for a child after my decease. In other words, while vessels made of silver were attractive and useful, they were also a wise investment and a secure inheritance for his descendants. And if they were personalized with family armorials or monograms, Long will their history survive. 
Tennis is certainly not the only competitive sport that honors its champions with silver trophies. Horse racing, for example, has a long and storied history, going back to ancient times. Although enjoyed in England during the Tudor period, it became especially popular in the late 17th century. Frequently the domain of royalty, nobility, and the well-to-do, it was an elite sport, and awards for the victors were typically made of either silver or gold. And I show you here the uh, 1688 Basingstoke plate, which utilized a silver monteith as its prize. The monteith is a vessel with a notched rim that was used to cool wine glasses by hanging them by their feet uh, with the bowls uh, hanging into the iced water so the foot would uh, fit into the notch. The rim of a monteith was usually detachable so that the bowl could alternatively be used for serving punch. And I hope you can see on the uh, far right slide that the flat chasing has uh, includes a, a at the image of a horse and rider. The bowl is inscribed on one side, Basingstoke Plate, October the 2nd, 1688. And the race that year was won by Edward Chute. Just as an aside, um, let me mention here something that I want to say about silver, which is that it is the one art form routinely personalized through the use of inscriptions, monograms, or armorials. And this helps to open the doors to research on its history and I think makes it a, a very personal and special media. As I expect you know, horse racing is a favorite sport of Queen Elizabeth II, who from an early age has been passionate about horses. She owns and breeds thoroughbreds for racing and you can just imagine her delight when her three-year-old filly called Estimate won the Queen's vase at Royal Ascot in 2012. Here she is accepting the gold cup from her son, Prince Andrew. And on the left, I show you an image of Estimate written by Rocky, sorry, jockey Ryan Moore, wearing Her Majesty's registered racing silks, consisting of a purple and scarlet jacket with gold braiding and a black cap. Organized horse racing in this country began in the spring of 1665 when Richard Nichols, first British colonial governor of the province of New York, announced the establishment of a race to be run twice yearly on Long Island. The first racetrack built in what is now New York City proper was the Church Farm Course at Trinity Church, where races for the New York subscription plate were run from 1725 until 1753. And I show you here the 1751 bowl for that race, which is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. It is engraved around the top, this plate won by a horse called Old Tenor, belonging to Lewis Morris Jr., October the 11th, 1751. And Old Tenor, the victor, um, uh, was, as I said, the horse of Lewis Thomas, excuse me, Lewis Morris Jr., uh, whose 1750 portrait by John Wollaston is now in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. Although unmarked, this silver bowl follows the standard mid 18th century formula of a hemispherical body on a stepped foot. The characteristic depiction of a horse and rider, which is evident on many of these bowls, is probably copied from an English sporting print. Old Tenor's owner, Lewis Morris Jr., was described as, quote, the primary New York turf magnate. And although this is a New York story, it uh, it, the bull descended to one of his grandsons, also called Lewis Morris, who married a Charleston woman, Elizabeth Manigo, in 1807, giving this bull a, a glimmer of Southern history. Another meaningful category of presentation silver is called church plate, simply meaning objects donated to religious organizations by their members or supporters, often to mark an important life event or perhaps some thanks for a blessing such as the recovery of a loved one. Such objects, which are frequently preserved for centuries in the care of institutions, are routinely well-documented and rarely altered. So it give, that gives them a, a real meaning, a real um, uh, gravitas in the world of antique silver. Here, for instance, is a pair of early beakers made about 1719 by a Barnstable, Massachusetts silversmith called Moody Russell. 
The simple inscription on these beakers reads, the gift of Shirjaba born Esquire to the church at Sandwich, 1719. You will see, however, that the engraver made an error on the left-hand beaker and had to add the word at, spelled here A-T-T, with the aid of an er uh, editor's carrot. Uh, I just find engraving on silver a, a frequent source of delight and a very special aspect of the medium. And I should also mention that the same engravers who executed inscriptions on silver were also the ones who were engraving on copper plates for printing. An example of Southern church silver is this alms basin made by the Scottish born Charleston silversmith, Alexander Petrie around 1755. The basin, which is traditionally French in style with its broad scalloped flutes, was commissioned for an Anglican church, St. George's Parish in Dorchester, not far from Charleston. The donor was a socially prominent planter and public official named Henry Middleton. Silver historian Brandy Culp has suggested that Middleton might have commissioned this impressive piece to commemorate his appointment by the Crown to the South Carolina Council, or perhaps to celebrate the addition of a new bell tower to the church in 1754. Military and naval trophies constitute another major category of presentation silver. This magnificent covered vase was made by Philadelphia silversmiths Thomas Fletcher and Sidney Gardner to commemorate the Battle of New Orleans the final victory in the War of 1812. It too carries a Charleston history since as its engraved inscription relates, it was presented in 1816 by the ladies of South Carolina to their native son, Major General Andrew Jackson, who is depicted here in the Metz circa 1819 portrait by John Wesley Jarvis. In overall form and ornament, the Jackson vase is a splendid example of American neoclassical silver including coiled snake handles, bands of acanthus leaves, excuse me, acanthus and laurel leaves. The influence of early 19th century French and English silver is especially evident here as well in the scaly coiled handles and the sturdy paw feet. And this also reflects uh, Thomas Fletcher's absorption of current trends coming in from overseas. And he did, he did visit um, uh, England and the continent himself. The commanding eagle finial on the Jackson vase was originally accompanied by four identical castings that were bolted in the French manner onto the pedestal base. However, an act of vandalism committed over a century ago resulted in the current replacement of the uh, small eagles on the, on the base. We do know how the vase originally looked thanks to a surviving preparatory drawing, uh, which you see on the right. And this is, by the way, one of about 35 drawings purchased in 1953 by the Metropolitan Museum. Quite a miracle really that drawings like this survive uh, because they were normally pinned up, crumpled, written on, tossed on the floor, trod upon, and eventually discarded. So it's, um, it's wonderful that we have these drawings uh, as uh, examples of what the process was. Some of them are quite modest sketches and others as here are carefully detailed renderings executed by an accomplished draftsman, uh, and in this case, closely related to the Finnish object. The bold elegance of this vase immediately captures our attention, but the story behind its presentation really unfolds in the lower frieze, uh, which I'm showing you here in the drawing. And here the artist has depicted in brilliant shorthand fashion, the victorious defense of New Orleans by General Jackson's forces on the 8th of January, 1815. At the far left, American soldiers identified by the fluttering stars and stripes form a tightly regimented column, their muskets and cannons discharging furious billows of smoke. A rearing horse and rider gestures backwards at, at, on the uh, right uh, hand side towards the retreating British troops, one of whom lies dead at the center of the frieze. And as you can see, the battle date is inscribed above. Now I'm tempted to say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but this image doesn't tell the entire story. Ironically, unbeknownst to the weary troops, although probably known to many of you, the Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war, had been signed two weeks earlier on December 24th, 1814. 
News, however, traveled slowly in 1815. Uh, and so they, they simply didn't know that the war was over. Nonetheless, the Battle of New Orleans was a major victory for the American forces under General Jackson's command. Sometimes even a relatively modest object gains importance by virtue of its presentation inscription, as is evident in this map case made by Charleston silversmith Louis Boudot in 1825. Measuring almost 10 inches tall and just one and five sixteenths inches deep, it was created to hold an 1822 map of South Carolina. As engraved on its face, this case was, quote, presented by Richard J. Manning, governor of South Carolina, in the name of the state, to General Lafayette whilst at Columbia in March 1825. In tracing your route through our territory, every inhabited spot will recall to your memory the devotion and affection of a grateful people, which is, of course, where I got the title for my book. The map case was one of many objects presented to the Marquis de Lafayette during his 13 month farewell tour of the United States in 1824 to 1825. The so-called hero of two worlds, the French aristocrat who fought in the Continental Army during the, the American Revolution and who later became a powerful advocate for constitutional monarchy in, uh, during the French Revolution. Lafayette was revered by many, many citizens of this country as one of our own founding fathers. Triumphal arches were constructed to mark his parade route through many of the cities he visited, honoring his heroism in a, a manner reminiscent of antiquity. And while many of the objects presented to him on his tour were small and portable, the map case actually took mobility as its theme, commemorating Lafayette's movement around the United States, where he was met by crowds of admirers at every stop. It has even been suggested by one scholar that this object representing the themes of geography, travel, and historical commemoration parallels Lafayette's own contributions as a military hero and patriot. More personal items such as jewelry, watches, baby cups, or gold boxes are frequently bestowed upon an individual to honor a life passage or an important achievement. But domestic items too can be personalized to mark special moments. One excellent example is this splendid seven piece tea and coffee service presented in 1861 to Francis Henson Hatch, collector of the Port of New Orleans. A native of Vermont, Hatch served as New Orleans customs collector from 1857 until 1862, when the city was captured by the Federal Navy. The service, which is now in the collection of historic New Orleans, is designed in the curvilinear Rococo revival style popular at that time with rounded bodies and scrolled handles and spouts. It also retains uh, certain neoclassical motifs such as beaded borders and egg and dart banding, um, which is typical of the Rococo period, the Rococo revival as well, but neoclassicism, little bits of it continue uh, to, uh, um, to appear. Each piece of the service is decorated with engraved and chased ornament that tells the story of trade in New Orleans. And individual pieces are uh, stamped with the mark of Turfloff and Kuchler, a New Orleans firm established in 1858 by two German immigrants, best known for their presentation silver. And let me just um, take a moment to recommend to you uh, this article by Lydia Blackmore, decorative arts curator of, historic New of the Historic New Orleans Collection, which addresses the work of Christoph, Christoph Christian Kuchler and his silversmithing partners, first Adolf Himmel and later Bernard Turfloff. The article is entitled Chasing Southern Dreams, Two German Silversmiths in New Orleans, and you can find it on the website of the Decorative Arts Trust. And I, I thank um, uh, uh, Lydia for writing this article, and to her and Sarah Duggan, my thanks as well for providing me with images for this presentation. The service includes three very similar pots with curved handles and spouts, each surmounted by a fruit form finial representing fruits grown in the south, and each varying slightly in size and certainly in decoration. I'll just take a moment here to, to um, mention a, a question I often get is how can you tell the difference between a teapot and a coffee pot when they are of a similar shape such as here. 
Now I haven't handled these particular objects, but I can tell you that in general, a teapot will have piercing behind the spout, uh, either in a, a circle or um, oval, or maybe even something more decorative, such as a heart in a diamond shape. And that was meant to catch the tea leaves and keep them from pouring into the cup uh, with, the, with the tea. A coffee pot or a hot water pot will just have a single circular or oval uh, hole behind the spout. Each of these candles is equipped with ivory fillets to protect the pourer's hands, since silver is a very good conductor of heat. Let me just point them out to you. Here we go, at each end of the handle. This has caused problems um, since for, uh, because of fish and wildlife regulations, but that's another story. Lydia has identified the three pots left to right as a hot water pot, uh, a teapot, and a coffee pot. And the hot water pot would have simply been used to refill the teapot or even to water down the tea if it had um, become too strong from oversteeping. The decoration on the hot water pot includes um, this wonderful representation at the center of a uh, female um, figure of commerce resting on the shipping containers along the levees at the Port of New Orleans. And to her right are bales of cotton and casks of other agricultural exports. And on her left are bundles, barrels, and crates of imported goods, one of which has Chinese characters suggesting imports from the Far East, and that's right here. And another is marked Care CK, which are the initials of the maker, Christian Kuchler. On both the coffee pot on the right and the teapot on the left, uh, we see views of New Orleans on the Mississippi River. And let me just show you the teapot here, uh, where we see an image on the far right of a bearded father of the waters pouring out the Mississippi from the urn tucked under his right arm with a long oar, uh, long handled oar paddle in his left hand. He is seated in an Eden like garden setting, but the river then flows southward to a more tropical Louisiana landscape, complete with a palm tree and an alligator at the left. And please don't miss this adorable alligator. Here we go, right here. The sugar bowl, which you will notice does not have those ivory fillets uh, in its handles, no need here, is charmingly ornamented with the scene of a Louisiana sugar plantation. And on the far right, um, you can see the grand house in the detail, <clears throat> excuse me, and a sugar mill in the background with its smokestacks um, of billowing smoke, and with a locomotive in the foreground to the left. The waste bowl on the right, into which dregs of tea could be emptied, is ornamented with a beehive, an anchor, <clears throat> and agricultural tools, while the cream pitcher on the left features Louisiana vegetation and flowers, palmettos, and sugar cane. Here also, you can see the inscription that appears on each piece of the service. <clears throat> Excuse me. Presented to F.H. Hatch, collector of the Port of New Orleans by his friends in the Custom House, May 1st, 1861. I'd also like to point out here the um, uh, beautiful chasing, beautifully executed of the leaves and flowers. This would have been accomplished by hammering uh, in repousse or embossing from inside, and then uh, that creates the raised ornament, and then sharpening it up with finer chasing tools and hammers on the outside. The largest item is the monumental tray with its egg and dart border and curvilinear handles. It is ornamented on its surface with a border of decorative strap work and with two shaped medallions. And the medallion at the top uh, encloses the names of the committee who presented this service and the lower medallion is engraved with this uh, presentation inscription I've just read to you. Each medallion is bordered by two flags, one with the single star alongside 13 stripes, which is the flag of independent Louisiana here and here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and this was flown from January 26, 1861, when Louisiana seceded from the Union until March 21, 1861, when it officially joined the Confederate States of America. The other is the first national Confederate flag, its seven stars representing the first seven states to secede. 
In the center of the tray is a carefully engraved depiction of the New Orleans Custom House, which was, of course, Francis Hatch's domain as collector of the Port of New Orleans, a position to which he had been appointed in 1857 by President James Buchanan. And you will see that the Custom House also flies the Confederate flag. I will conclude with one final and quite appropriate sporting award, the Sugar Bowl Trophy. This elaborate two-handled cup made in London in 1825-26 is marked by the silversmithing partnership of Rebecca Eames and Edward Barnard. Uh, and let me just say that the date, dating of English silver, this 1825-26, the, for those of you who don't know, is because uh, each date letter, each ro re rotating date letter, uh, uh, changed on in May of each year so that you uh, so that it um, uh, covered two years in date. Rebecca Eames is one of the best known of the uh, English women silversmiths and like many women who entered the trade she was the widow of a silversmith called John Eames. Shortly after her husband's death she entered into partnership with Edward Barnard, a member of a famous uh, English silversmithing family. The traditional vase-shaped two-handled cup sits on a stepped circular foot, and it's heavily ornamented with scrolls, elongated egg and dart decoration, and a band of cast and applied leaves encircling the top. However, the cup has been altered in a number of ways, which incidentally is not unusual for a piece of silver over time as it changed hands or perhaps even functions, uh, as in this case. And so, for instance, soldered to the rim above the leaves are the applied letters spelling out Sugar Bowl Classic. The body of the cup has also been engraved on this side with the inscription, Auspices, New Orleans Midwinter Sports Association, and on the reverse with a running list of Sugar Bowl champions and their dates. It, uh, for any of you unfamiliar with the Sugar Bowl, it is a college football game that is played annually in New Orleans on New Year's Day, uh, since January 1st, 1935. The idea of such an event was first proposed in 1927 by Colonel James M. Thompson, who was publisher of the New Orleans, uh, New Orleans Item, and his sports editor, Fred Digby. Digby even came up with a name for the event, the Sugar Bowl, to recognize Louisiana's role as a national leader in sugar production. It took another eight years, however, before the sugar, first Sugar Bowl was finally played. And um, fittingly, this silver cup was donated to the New Orleans, New Orleans Midwinter Sports Association by the Waldhorn Company for the express purpose uh, of being the Sugar Bowl trophy. Waldhorn's was established in 1881 as a pawn shop by Moise Waldhorn, an immigrant from Alsace, France, at the corner of Royal and Conti Streets. And he began to acquire furniture and jewelry from local families, selling off their possessions in the decades following the Civil War, thereby becoming one of the earliest antique stores uh, in the city. And it operated in the same location for over 130 years until its closure in 2013. Clearly the cup has been augmented to serve its current role. In addition to the plied and engraved inscriptions on the bowl that we looked at earlier, it has now gained a monumental stepped platform uh, with text announcing Sugar Bowl Classic Champion, as well as the logos of its sponsor since 2007, Allstate Insurance. And to crown it off, a circular cover was added, its finial appropriately fashioned as a football. Now, lest you doubt the significance of a somewhat fussy and old fashioned silver bowl to uh, hale and hardy football players, here it is in the hands of the current champions, the Ohio State Buckeyes, who defeated the Clemson Tigers at the 87th Sugar Bowl on January 1st, 2021, thereby advancing to the 2021 college football, uh, excuse me, college football playoff national championship, uh, which was played on the 11th of January. Unfortunately, the Buckeyes were defeated by the top seeded Alabama Crimson Tide, but never mind that. Here we see the Ohio State coach, Ryan Day at the left, quarterback Justin Fields, and linebacker Tuff Boland in a shower of confetti and triumphantly hoisting aloft the Sugar Bowl trophy. I hope that I have clarified why, since time immemorial, this precious medal 
fashioned into objects of beauty and utility, gains even further luster when used to commemorate important occasions and significant life passages. And although all of the objects I've shown you today were presented to men, I would like to bookend my opening slide by closing with this photograph of Barbora Krejcikova celebrating her victory in the 2021 French Open Women, Women's Singles Championship. Her very first Grand Slam, Novak Wood has, had won 19, this was her first. And she celebrates by kissing her hard won silver trophy, which in, incidentally came with a financial prize of $1.69 million and a very significant professional and personal achievement for this 25 year old athlete. Brava Barbora. <laughs> with that, I come to the end of my talk. I thank you very much for watching. The Historic New Orleans Collection would like to thank New Orleans Silversmiths for its long-standing support of the Antiques Forum. Located at 600 Charter Street, the shop features unusual hand-selected estate and modern barware, jewelry, silver tableware, and more. Learn more at neworleanssilversmiths.com.